Hi again, everyone. So it's, uh, it's noon now, Eastern, according to, to my clock. So um, I'll get started um, with the housekeeping items and things, and we'll have people join us um, over the next couple of minutes. And then hopefully everyone's on the line for um, when Paul gets, gets going. So welcome everyone to our webinar. Um, it's end PJ paralysis, say good night to hospital gowns, get up, get dressed, get moving. And it's facilitated by the Loop Fall Prevention Community of Practice. Uh, my name's Michelle Dukeman. I am the Knowledge Translation Coordinator of the Fall Prevention Program at Parachute. Um, Parachute now sponsors the Fall Prevention Communities of Practice Loop and Loop Junior, uh, and along with the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign. Um, and this is our second webinar uh, under Parachute. Uh, before we get going, uh, I just wanna cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, during the webinar, if you have questions about the technology, please type them into the chat box. So those are tech questions in the chat box. Uh, and my colleague, Marguerite Thomas, uh, will be monitoring um, the chat box for this. Uh, and if you have questions for our presenter, uh, about the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A box. Um, they will be answered at the end of the webinar, uh, and you'll only be able to view questions you have asked, not questions posed by other participants. Um, the webinar is being recorded, uh, and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about uh, a week or so, along with the presentation slides. Um, you can view previous webinars uh, by simply heading over to the webinar page on Loop and clicking on uh, archived webinars. So that's what that looks like on our platform. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the, the exciting part and I'm going to introduce our presenter Paul Wright. Paul has uh, worked as a registered uh, a nurse in the neurosciences field for the Ottawa Hospital and the Foothills Medical Center in Calgary. Uh, during his career, Paul has been the former unit manager for the inpatient neurological rehabilitation unit, the manager for the Calgary Zone Patient Family Centered Care Program, and is currently the executive director for the Neuroscience Rehab and Vision Strategic Clinical Network. Uh, for a complete bio on our presenter, uh, please visit the Zoom webinar invitation or check out Loop. So without further ado, please take it away, Paul. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll let you share. Wonderful, thank you, Michelle. I'll get my uh, screen set up here and we'll get started. So thanks for that beautiful introduction and, and thank you everyone for joining and, and being able to be present with us today. Okay, so well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you're joining from. I'm just delighted to be able to share my key messages of NPJ paralysis. So say good night to hospital gowns, how we get our patients up, dressed and moving for better health. But before we get started, it's important for me uh, to recognize what we're all going through in this time and, and just outline how grateful I am of all of you to support our patients and families through the current pandemic. Certainly here in Alberta, it's felt like Groundhog Day, which is one of our, our movies from 1990s. You have Bill Murray here, you know, talking about, well, it's quarantine day again, and it, it's been a real challenge, but I want us to, to look forward and understand how PJ paralysis could be maybe a, a small hope or a glimmer of light uh, in, in our focus going ahead. So thank you for all that you do, and we'll continue on throughout the presentation today. So my focus today is to talk to you about deconditioning, how it relates to falls and how the practice of NPJ paralysis can support our patients, our staff, our hospital environment and our families as well. But first I'm gonna start with a little bit of, of the risks. I'm gonna set a foundation to understand why it's really important that we talk about some of these topics. So you put someone in uh, their 60s in bed for a week in an acute care, and this is what we're gonna expect to see. So you put, spend one week in bed and that is not atypical for our patients to be in bed almost the full week in acute care, especially if they have hip fractures or other diagnoses as well. But you, we can lose up to 20% off the total strength or muscle mass off our quads. And we know our quads are a huge muscle group to allow us to be able to ambulate and support, which is really important to understand. Our respiratory therapist colleagues would tell us that we lose about 10% off our aerobic capacity, our ability to inflate or open our lungs. And they would often equate that to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, how that has negative health effects on us for being sedate, lying in bed. So really important to understand some of these basics around deconditioning. 
but that's not it. There's so many more as well. So when patients, again, are sedated in, a, in a, a sedentary environment, especially after discharge, bedridden patients are more likely to have a greater risk of disability, need supports with activities of daily living up to one month later. Their walking abilities can dwindle up to a year. They can even have muscle weakness to three to five years later. And the one that makes me really sad or really upset uh, is that patients will need five times or have the five times the risk of needing institutional care. So going to a care home uh, after being uh, discharged from a hospital. And for me, that is something I really wanna focus on and work on. When our patients are coming to us for healthcare, we should be doing our best. I know there's lots of critical challenges with our patients, their acuity, but we should be doing our best to keep not only that immediate challenge and immediate healthcare concern, but their whole body as healthy as possible. So how can we keep our patients as physically and mentally fit in the hospital as they were when, before they came in the hospital? And I think that's a really important part of NPJ paralysis as well. But there's so much more. Um, hospital inactivity we know is associated with malnutrition, accelerated bone loss, delirium, uh, pressure injury ulcers, blood clots, or, or venous thrombosis uh, embolisms that we're calling it now. And why your group is here, patient falls, there's so many overlaps and parallels to inactivity and deconditioning that we really need to bring it front and center and tie all these initiatives and thoughts together. And I think that's a, one of the root causes why I'm here today as well. So one of the things I wanted to share with you as well is this is some stats from 2017 from the Canadian Institute of Healthcare Improvement or CHI-HI. And they've outlined that there's an upward trend in continuing care. Our trends are increasing and our patients need more assistance with their daily activities. The transferring, the hygiene, the dressing, toilet use, bed mobility have all gone up drastically. So our patients are needing more supports. So again, what can we do to keep them physically and mentally fit to maybe decrease some of these activities of daily needs, the needs that they have to make them more independent? But this isn't just a continuing care problem. I wanna highlight some focus as well. Uh, in 2012, a colleague of mine, Dr. Sean Duclos, is a stroke physiatrist in the Calgary uh, Stroke Rehab Program. Him and his uh, researcher team followed patients around to see and understand what they did outside of therapy times on an acute stroke unit. And what Sean uncovered was pretty staggering. What you can see here from the graph on the left-hand side is actually anything in the blue or the dark blue was actually active pursuits, what our patients were doing outside of care to be active. And on the right-hand side in the orange or those light orange is actually what they're doing to inactive. So Sean and his team followed the patients during the waking hours, documented basically in five to 10 minute increments what they were doing uh, during their hospital stay. And sadly, about 45 to 50% of their time, patients were watching TV, sleeping, or doing nothing. And I know sleeping can be a, a therapeutic intervention uh, but these were patients that had had restful sleeps throughout the night. It was really around boredom and isolation that some of the challenges were. So even on a stroke unit that's been recognized internationally as providing some of the best care in the world, getting some of the best outcomes, is showing that we need to do a little bit more to get our patients in active pursuits. This doesn't always mean that it's therapy one-on-one -on -one time, but what can we do to keep our mind physically active, our, our brains physically active, and maybe even some supportive exercises that patients can do while they're in the unit outside of therapy times. Now I'm showing you a slide from 1947, and this is Dr. Asher, and what he's bringing forward is he's talking about the dangers of going to bed. And you're probably thinking, well, what's, what's this got to do with anything, Paul? This is almost you know, 100 years old. But this post-World War II article shows us that this is when we started to talk about the dangers of going to bed. Being sedated in bed is not an okay thing. And it's, it's quite historical that it's been brought forward. And Dr. Asher outlines it, teach us to live that we may dread unnecessary time in bed. Get people up and we may save our patients from an early grave. So important to think about. Uh, and again, this is an older problem, but it keeps resurfacing. So again, what is it has changed in our care in the last 20 years that maybe have moved away from uh, a different care model, maybe to a medical model? And I'll touch on that a little bit later. As I started and, and recognized and acknowledged at the start, this last year has been quite daunting and challenging for a lot of us. And we've all had to change our wardrobe, whether it's a hospital gown or shorts on a Zoom call or hopefully wearing pants or as well. Um, but this last year, it's, it's been interesting. And I'll share personally for myself that I worked from home being an administrative role 
uh, for the last 18 months now. And at, I'll be honest, at times, dealing with emergency crises with COVID and, and, fo and focusing on our visitation challenges in the province have really hit me hard with my mental health. And I've had to take my own advice. I've had to get up, get dressed and get moving uh, for many times. Uh, I recall a week over Christmas where I was working and you know my mental health wasn't the greatest. And I picked up uh, my own advice and I put on a suit. I wore a suit and a tie that for every day that week. And I felt I felt better. Just that routine of getting out and, and breaking monotony up was really important. So if we reflect on what it's been like to be in our own homes, now let's think about what it's been like to be patients in care and how challenging that can be. The other thing that we can think of, March 2020 hits, and we see one of the world's greatest disruptions in a generation. The unknown fear of the pandemic sinks in, and we are, the way we provide care dra changes drastically. Visitors are, see this red hand to stop, don't come in. Pre-arranged visits must be uh, must be arranged with family members. The anxiety of having a loved one in hospital and not being able to care or talk for them in some cases is really challenging. We've had to rely on strangers to keep us updated and help us support in the care, and help us change those things that we know family members can really do. And I think the impact of visitors being restricted has has impacted the care we provide our patients and families. Our patients have had nowhere to go, and especially in our care center. We've had the, the focus of uh, the pandemic in front of us. Our policies and procedures are very much around restrictive and uh, supportive to make sure that we are ensuring that the spread of the disease does not happen. So our patients have been placed in a box uh, in the room. And again, because of the right reasons, but it has had negative impacts on the way we provide care. Especially if a patient has had a COVID diagnosis, there's no way they've been allowed out of their room. They're seeing, family, or they're seeing uh, nurses and physicians and allied health come in with shields and masks and it's, it can be daunting and challenging for them. So I also want to understand that this is not the right time. Uh, this is not the greatest time to uh, get ambulation going, but what can we do in the meantime to break up the monotony? Maybe there are some small things, some tips and tricks we can do to get our patients up and moving, to prevent falls, to prevent pressure ulcers in those VTEs and help mental health. We've had challenges to personal belongings coming into our hospitals. And certainly early on, there, were, there was no provisions of clothing, footwear, those culturally appropriate items, the food that people really enjoy and love that make that personal care so important. So that again, that role of family being taken away has really impacted patients. The comfortability of wearing their own clothing, maybe feeling that they wanna get up now because they have something on that they maybe feel they could walk around in and feel comfortable. They have absolutely been impacted as well. And those small pieces can make a big difference. And the big one, and I think you look at, you take away family members, you take away the ability to bring in clothing, you take away the culture, the appropriate food items, our activities of daily living, I think have been impacted in a huge way, especially those that require supports from a loved one or a family member. It's really important to think about how do we support eating, bathing, dressing, transferring, toileting, walking, and moving around, and not only in care, but outside of care. And we've had we've lost that ability to have that confidence with our patients and families to help support the changes they might have uh, at the end of uh, their stay or closer to discharge. So why I bring these things up is this is the current environment we're in. We have to work within the buckets, but we also have the ability to get innovative and be creative. And that's what I want to share with you now going forward is there are ways we can come across and get through this. It just takes a little bit of creativity, connection, ingenuity. So that's why I'm here to talk to you about NPJ paralysis. And NPJ paralysis is a term to describe the negative physical and psychological effects experienced by patients who spend lengthy periods of time inactive in their hospital gown or pajamas. We also know that, as I shared earlier, people with lengthy periods of stay lose muscle strength which can lead to longer hospital stays. And we know that only wearing pajamas can also make a person feel less human, feel more vulnerable, and constantly remind them they're ill. I'll, I will outline that the PJ paralysis movement was started by my close colleague and friend, Brian Dolan, a registered nurse working in the United Kingdom's National Health Service, as well as many other health services across the world. How we describe NPJ paralysis is a little bit unique, and we like to break it down into two pieces. One, respect and dignity, which I'll share with you in a moment, and two, deconditioning, which we've talked a little bit about, and I'll expand upon in a moment as well. So that respect and dignity, and actually before I get started, I'm going to outline why we even started PJ paralysis in my uh, health authority. As a manager of patient family center care at the time, I was dealing and supporting with a site patient concern, 
And unfortunately, a, a lady was walking close to discharge, wearing a hospital gown with an allied health colleague. And whether the HVAC system kicked on or the door opened, uh, unfortunately, this lady was exposed inappropriately to many members of the public. We got asked to, to debrief and understand what happened, what occurred here, why was the situation happening? People thought, well, let's just create new gowns. That's a way out. And we, we thought, no, I don't think that's the root of the cause. We investigated a bit more and found out that absolutely this lady should have been and could have been wearing her own clothes as she was uh, a day to, uh, outside of a discharge. And it would have been appropriate actually to have her in her own clothes and to see how she could get dressed. So we thought, what's going on here? Maybe there's something else. We looked internationally and found that there is this NPJ paralysis piece. So a lot of our, our work stems and learning from patient concerns. And I would urge you in your organization to think about what concerns have we had lately? What are the things that we can learn from? And is there a, a unique initiative like NPJ paralysis that can help support that? Our patients outline that there's psychological harm of wearing a gown. As, and I'll show a picture here in a moment, but absolutely we've all seen the picture of a patient's bum crack or being exposed in a hospital. And patients tell us that that does hurt after a while. They don't want to get out of their bed. Their fear of being laughed at or pointed at or being exposed absolutely can impact them. And it does impact their, their ability to mobilize. Patients will tell us when they bring their own clothing in, it's a self a sense identity, self identity, sorry. You know, you could wear your favorite hockey jersey, whether that's, um, you know, uh, maybe a favorite cowboy hat, jeans, boots, something that makes you feel like you. And it makes you feel more comfortable to get out of your bed, get up, get dressed, get moving. So patients really want that sense of control and support. And when they're in the hospital gowns, we've actually heard patients tell us that they don't feel they can question their care at all. They feel they're very much institutionalized in a hospital gown. So it's important to understand and think and listen about what we're hearing. This article here actually was from the National Post about three years ago, and I really, really like it. It's outlined something cheeky and pardon the pun, but it's the dreaded hospital gown described as healthcare's prison jumpsuit, often imposed needlessly on patients. So this was a study between five hospitals between Toronto and Montreal, and they surveyed the patients to say, hey, would you like to wear your own clothing? And about 60% of patients said, yes, I would love to. But unfortunately, only about 10% of them were honored to or welcome to wear their own clothing. And patients felt this could have been impacted their stay as well. Um, and again, that picture of, of this gentleman's butt crack, we've all seen that. And wouldn't it be nice to get past this to see patients ambulating in something comfortable that they can actually wear? And we do know that clothing can be a barrier at times. Um, but when it is, it's still in focus to walk, get up and get dressed and get moving and get walking as much as we can to prevent that deconditioning piece. So deconditioning, as I mentioned, is that other key piece of NPJ paralysis. And hospital environment limits mobility. Let's be honest, hospitals were not designed um, for people to get up and ambulate. Rooms are, are, are jammed with two, three, four, five patients even now during with some pandemic work. Um, and there's not a lot of space to move around. You have IV equipment, you have wheelchairs in the hallway, med carts, uh, computers on wheels, you name it, it's out there. So that our hospital environment really limits mobility and actually doesn't promote it in a lot of ways. Um, it, it forces us back to the care environment. And that's really what that next bullet is about care is around the bed. And I, I myself as a registered nurse, I am so guilty of this. Uh, but I, I commit bed centricity, what I like to call it, where patients care is always around that four by six hospital bed. And I don't know why we do it. But it is a culture in our care, we ask patients to consistently and constantly go back to their bed for meds to wait for the doctor to wait for an intervention. And it's like that's our safe little space. And that's okay. But we need to reflect on why we do that. And if it's possible, encourage our patients maybe not to go back to bed, but to walk to the elevator, walk to a common space where we are allowed to in these days. And lastly, the focus currently tends to be on medical pathways. And that's not a bad thing, but you think of our, I've talked to many senior nurses or nurse nurses that have uh, just recently retired. The focus of bedtime or HS care was always a back rub. And my generation of nurses would think, oh, that's wild. We don't have time for that. But you think about it, that back rub allowed the, the nurse to connect with the patient, do a skin assessment, 
look at, at how they're functioning, talk about the next day, their care plans. Where now, and I'm not saying this is negative, our patients are so sick, they're focusing on them. We have to focus on the medical pathways, the acuity. And at times we get caught up in that, the acuity and forget that there are really other important things that can support patients in the long and short term, such as preventing deconditioning. So those three pieces, I think, and again, are not the fault of anyone's, but it's really important to reflect and understand how can these pieces of hospital uh, limit mobility, care around the bed, and medical pathways really change our practice and move forward. So in Alberta, I wanted to share a little bit about what we worked on and what we did. We looked to have 60% of our patients up dressed and moving before 10 a.m. And this was the goal that was set internationally with the National Health System with Brian Dolan's team in England when they were doing their, their huge campaign about two years ago. We wanted to replicate uh, what they were putting forward and, and potentially look and co correlate their data. At times, it was challenging to meet our goals, and we got caught up in going up and down rabbit holes around inclusion criteria. Who can be involved in this, Paul? What about this patient, that patient? How far do we need to walk to say that a patient's ambulated? What counts as being up and not? And you know what we did? We stepped back and we said, we're getting caught up in, in the details here. This initiative is really about patients getting up, dressed, and moving. Let's not put so many uh, policies or procedures on top of this that we might limit how we can spread. So everyone's included in this. There is no exclusion criteria. Even if you can get someone dressed, that's such an important thing up for one meal. So we did not look at an inclusion exclusion criteria. And we really encourage our patients and families to get involved as much as we possibly can. Over these last few years in pre-COVID, we had about 20 hospitals in our health authority start and, and launch MPG paralysis with about another dozen waiting to move into here uh, pre or post-COVID times as well. So very proud of the work we've been able to do and establish here in Alberta, Alberta Health Services. But why we're here today, what are some of the linkages to NPJ paralysis and patient falls? And, and there are a ton, trust me. But, and this group knows this content much more than I, but I thought I'd set a, base, a bit of a base context. We know that falls are the leading cause of injury among uh, older Canadians. We know that care has a huge cost associated with falls of up to $2 billion a year with direct health care costs. And we know that 50% of all fa falls causing hospitalization can happen at home as well. So this is not just a, a hospital problem. This is a community, a global global problem actually, an all person problem. When you look at our data here in Alberta, you look at the falls, they're leading cause of injuries amongst our seniors. And one out of every three seniors will fall in a year. And that number goes up to one every two over the age of 80. We know that 95% of hip fractures and 40% of all nursing home falls uh, are associated with admission, admissions to our emergency room as well. There's a huge need and a huge understanding for a group like Loop and a, a huge need and huge understanding for healthcare providers to focus on the causation, the risks and the challenges of patient falls. I want you to reflect now and I'm going to ask you a bit of a question here. So get ready for the chat box. But do you think that NPJ paralysis will increase our falls in our care institutions? So you've heard me talk a little bit about, about how NPJ paralysis is important to get our patients up, dressed and moving in the care environments. We know that our patients might not be as, as physically or mentally strong or physically or mentally fit, but it's important to think about what can they do uh, to get up and moving. But I'm curious from the group here, I would love to hear, do you think that NPJ paralysis will increase your falls in the care institutions? So take a look in your chat box, put a thumbs up, thumbs down, a yes or no, but I'd love to hear from you. And we're going to uncover now uh, over the next few slides, a few research articles that might lead us in one direction or the other. So Sweeney and her team in Australia studied NPJ paralysis uh, and, and specifically around the falls piece. And they looked at what um, they, sorry, they looked at uh, how NPJ paralysis was supporting functional decline and, and was it helping or decreasing that? And when they, they did investigate in their study was the falls specifically. So they looked at pre, during and post interventions and they looked at the falls on their patient unit. And what they did uncover and outline is that falls pre, during and post were almost identical. So that NPJ paralysis specifically in this study did not have an increase in patient falls in their, in their bedside care, or sorry, in their, in their practice that it was the same. Furthermore, when you look at Crabtree and her team in early 2021, they outlined that NPJ paralysis was also not associated with falls in their study. And they thought this was really important to bust this myth as commonly feared people think that getting patients up will lead to more falls. And, and, in, and these studies were outlining that it's not seeing that reflection at all. 
Safer Care in Victoria, Australia also recently published an outline to decrease in falls rate, as well as others such as length of state, a stay uh, pressure ulcers, and specifically in those sites that had high performing that were reaching their target. So again, thinking and understanding that MPJ paralysis, although we are encouraging our patients to get up and moving, we're not seeing that correlation to increase in falls in published studies across the world. And certainly when you look at our Alberta context, when we've studied our own personal data here, we've seen something similar. And actually I will outline something that I am quite proud of. Our fall rates have stayed the same, which isn't that great because I was hoping to de decrease our fall rates. But what I am proud of and what I am happy of, those falls are actually are occurring, are occurring with less injury or less intense. So it's near slips and trips versus the falls with associated injury. So I am very positive and, and happy to see that that is happening and occurring in our care institutions. So with NPJ paralysis, I often call it an umbrella term. It's something, as I mentioned, it can fit under many, many other initiatives. And one thing I thought I would practically bring forward with the group here today that fits so poetically is a, a practice called Walkers Gone Wild. And we started this very, very uh, recently after NPJ paralysis as they were so meld together and connected together. And what we did is we set this in our, our uh, long-term care or continuing care centers as a, something to encourage personalization, individuality, as well as mobilization in our care centers. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about why that's important too. So we know, and this is pre-COVID, so you can imagine our actual data now in this next little while, but 50% of seniors in Canada are inactive and anywhere from up to 43% of our seniors in Canada are socially isolated as well. And that's scary. And as I mentioned, this is pre-COVID. So think about post-COVID or in long COVID or inner COVID where we're thinking of our patients and our, our seniors being in their in their care areas, in their rooms for the most of, of their times as well. Those haunting pictures of families waving to their loved ones out a window. Those are the things that we've been faced with. You look at device acceptance and people wanting and using their own walkers. And you think of 46% of Canadian seniors who report having a health problem that limits their mobility do not use an aid. So that is something concerning and could potentially lead to more falls as well. But when you look at the practice of walkers gone wild and having a patient actually decorate their own walker, and that's truly all it is, make it individualized, it, uh, we saw some great outcomes. And specifically, this originated in the United Kingdom in Essex, and they rolled it out across all of their care homes. They saw a reduction in falls by almost 60%. There was an involvement in decorating, which again brought that sense of identity, that sense of who I am to share with people that maybe orange is my favorite color, or again, maybe a favorite sports team or a picture of a loved one or a dog or something like that, that could bring that focus there. That allowed that social inclusion to say, hey, look, oh, I love your walker, let's talk about that. And people and visitors would often stop and talk to them. It makes the frames or the walkers recognizable to those that might be earlier onset uh, dementia or have challenges with memory. It brings a sense of ownership and again, a sense of personalization to say, this is mine, I'm proud of it and look at me go. So again, the small things that we could do such as decorating a walker or wheelchair and giving personalization can help hugely and immensely around supporting uh, ambulation deconditioning, even preventing falls. And the group actually had a study published uh, about two years ago as well, and they outlined uh, that this, this allows a new approach to some old problems, including falls and activity and social inclusion. Uh, and here uh, on the right hand side, you can see a, a picture of, of one of our patients in Alberta Health Services uh, that we actually decorated with license plates. And again, that was another initiative we thought, uh, hey, that could be cool. We can personalize license plates for, again, device acceptance and support with that. So another small easy thing that hopefully we can do with our patients, with our families, uh, to bring that sense of identity, social inclusion, and help with deconditioning and acceptance of our, our devices. So there was a lot of lessons learned over the times that we are working on NPJ paralysis, and I wanted to share a few with these with you as well. So for me, it was really important that we shifted the focus away from being a prescriptive practice, and that's why I have that X through that through there. We don't need to have a policy for everything we do. And sometimes asking or doing basic care can be easy. We just need to make sure staff understand and can provide permission. By asking a patient to get up, dressed and moving, that isn't something that should be a policy. It's not like giving blood, but at times we kind of put it in a medical model and think about all these constraints. 
but it is clearly it's about that message get up get dressed get moving how do we break those rules for better care that maybe our organization still has the focus of every patient gets a gown ask critically why why is that rule there why is that policy there think about how we can support that and move forward I'm sure you're wondering why I have a picture of the United Nation flag. And to be honest, I see each care unit we work with or each hospital we work with as its own country within a larger system. What works on one unit or one country won't work on another. Culture drives care whether we like it or not. And the one size fits all approach isn't working. We all don't speak the same language in care centers, although uh, we are supposed to and we think we do. The care on each unit is very different and the culture is different. So how do we focus on this? How do we implement a practice when we know things are different? We need to take time to ask the frontline staff what they think, how they can contribute, and, how, and what they feel can be accountable, what they can be accountable to and what they're worried about. Bless those myths and be transparent. It's so important to be honest and open about their concerns and do the same thing with our patients and our families as well. One thing I think is so successful that we don't do in healthcare enough is brand our initiatives. And I was very fortunate to be able to piggyback up upon the international success of NPJ paralysis and bring that to Canada as well as the Western provinces. But where we saw a great uptake was our brand. It was that get up, get dressed, get moving say goodnight to hospital gowns, having our early campaigns with these uh, cute little caricatures that we're able to identify patients, populations, and have some cool initiatives for, you know, to the right hand side, having these large four by six cutouts on the hallways with where our patients would stop, our families would stop and say, what's this? Oh, we can wear our own clothes here? Oh, that's cool. So again, having positive identity of saying that a patient could actually uh, recognize that this initiative is happening and be a part of it. And oftentimes why we love having a brand or identity is it helps bring that patient focus forward. Our staff are so busy doing so many policies, procedure updates, something happens daily that they need to be aware of. So the more we can get our patients and families involved in the messages, the better. And not relying on our staff to give the preview or the information of absolutely everything all the time. As I mentioned, this practice can be fairly straightforward. So encouraging and giving permission may be all that they need. But think about how that brand, that recognition, the visual cues can help you succeed, not only in this initiative, but many others as well. One thing I wanted to share with the group is a lesson learned was the use of social media as a tool like we would for um, sharing other messages like email or, or a, da a data set. Uh, build strategy into your plans and how you amplify your work is so important to use social media. I'll be honest, I was not a, a big fan of social media before I started this campaign, but the use of social media allowed for others to engage in the work, spread the work, and even get feedback, share, uh, and allow me to understand who else is working on this initiative. It allowed for the cre creation of amazing partnerships with external organizations. Uh, such as our professional colleges um, that historically we did not think to engage. So how could they share our messages? Our focus, whether it's a college or a health authority, really are the same. We're trying to support our patients, families, and staff. And it was great to have these partners, to do webinars with them, to not only talk about uh, the challenges in our, our hospital and Alberta Health Services, but as well as all Alberta and take it from a nursing lens, from an allied health lens, from a physician lens, from a quality improvement lens. So I encourage you to think about how we work and partner with our associations and colleges to help uh, garner and spread our messages. So important, make it fun. If we can in any way, try to attach it to local initiatives, special awareness days. I know we just had a, a patient safety day. It'll be patient family center care week coming up. We will have world stop pressure injury day in November 18th. So how can we piggyback onto some of these initiatives that already have platforms? How do you make it fun? How do you have that brand? How do you uh, capitalize on what's current, uh, current culture, like a, a trying an amazing race, um, using current uh, uh, TV and, and things like that. Make it fun. Have cheeky sayings like walkers gone wild. Um, those things are really important. It will make people think about it and remember, oh yeah, that's that thing. I remember that. I can do that. I, I can manage that. So make it fun as much as you possibly can. For me, working in patient center care, working in rehab, patients were such an important part of, of my career and why I, I wanna do these initiatives and get involved. 
So I often say it's so important to listen to the lived experience of the patient. It provides us so much uh, feedback, direction, support, and understanding where we need to go. I think gone are the days of the top-down approach of, we'll tell you what to do because we're the healthcare providers and we know best. I think now we're beginning and continuing to invite our patients in to understand what their experience is like so we can make our care better. And I would think that's so important to have our patients tell their stories and be active participants on developing the content. And through our MPG paralysis work, I can honestly say that a good chunk of our patients uh, were actively participants. Many of the slides were created by our patients. Many of our, our pamphlets, our information, our education, education were provided by and with and for our patients together, which was so cool to see such an important part of care and how we move forward. Link NPJ Paralysis or other initiatives in your organization together. As I mentioned, PJ Paralysis is simple. It can be an umbrella practice that fits with so many of those things that I talked about around deconditioning, pressure injuries, falls, malnutrition. What else is happening in your organization? How else can you attach it to it? Accreditation is always that big word that everyone's thinking about. When's that coming? PJ paralysis can help with a lot of that. And again, thinking of those four or five buckets it fits in, what can you do to have a campaign uh, to support those accreditation required organizational practices? Within Canada, we have a huge or, uh, movement around uh, MOVE, promoting mobilization. Maybe that started at your organization and maybe PJ paralysis is just that marketing machine you need to help push that next step. So think about that. Um, take a look at how other or other initiatives are happening in your organization, as I mentioned, even the awareness days that we have, and how can that amplify some of the practices that you're working on? Kind of in conclusion, before I talk about some of the key resources, I just wanted to share with you some key messages. So deconditioning can be defeated. It's been a challenge for us, especially this last 18 months to two years with the pandemic and having challenges of restrictions and keeping patients in the rooms and not having a, uh, those personal items and the, the challenges with activities of daily living, but deconditioning can be defeated. Think about other practices that get our patients up and moving. Oftentimes people will say, hey, Paul, have you ever heard about the term urinal paralysis? And I'd say, no, tell me a bit about it. But what they mean by that is putting a urinal on the patient's bedside table when they can physically walk themselves. It's important to think about all those small practices, push your patient to go that extra step, encourage them to take one more step, to get out and look around in the hallway, to see what's going on. And it's really important to think about those small things. So how do we prevent urinal or bedpan paralysis? Also something to think about. How can we learn from our, our, our other colleagues or other industries or even our military here in Canada? It's the old adage, you get up in the, in the morning, you make your bed, you get your dressed, you sign your shoes, you, you clean your locker. The more things you do, the more apt you're gonna be successful. And I think with PJ paralysis, it has those same mentalities of you'd be successful at one thing in the day, the more apt you're gonna to continue to be successful or, or follow up on those other activities. So thinking about how we can encourage our patients to do that. Maybe it's it's that one piece, that one focus thing. And it maybe it's not, um, uh, minute after minute, but maybe it's day after day, and you encourage them to walk down that those steps together. Make sure, as I mentioned, that patients are comfortable in their surroundings. So give them the ability to wear their own clothing, have a chance to you know, put on something that they might be apt to actually get out of the room and wear. As we saw in those pictures before that the open back or the butt crack is not always something that patients feel comfortable wearing and often they forget what they're doing because they're trying to protect so no one can actually see them, uh, their butt uh, or their backside. So think about that. Increase the comfortability in the surroundings. And again, clothing can be a barrier. Try not to let it be. If there are challenges with clothing, think about other ways you can get creative, even a little gown or something that could be helpful to cover that patient up. But again, focus on the deconditioning if clothing ever becomes a barrier. My hero, Terry Fox, um, always said when people asked him, Terry, how do you do it? How do you run a marathon every day for 162 days? You know, he's cheeky, but he'd always say one step at a time. And I think that's the message I want to tell you with your patients as well. Don't push too hard, but encourage them to take that one step like Terry did to run those marathons every day. Um, and I know he, he can be a sense of inspiration, but at the same time, he had to take that one step. He had to push himself and also think about those key pieces that uh, our patients can maybe learn from as, as one piece at a time and that can be attainable. 
some of the resources I wanted to share with you, and there's a whole host out there. So um, feel free to connect with me off, offline at any time, and I'll share my contacts here in a moment. But as I mentioned, it's really important for us to get that patient experience. And here are two wonderful social media posts and videos about two of our patients that uh, were actively getting up dressed and moving in the hospital, uh, in the Calgary hospital, actually. Uh, and the one woman on the right-hand side had a, a very challenging uh, rehab. Um, she was in the hospital for, for many, many months. And um, when she, this program was implemented, it, it really increased her mental health. You know, she became one of those people that were out of her rooms first in the day where you never saw her in the hallways before when she was in her gown. She focused on getting up, getting dressed, not only for her mental health, but her physical health and her recovery to learn how to walk again. So the patients can inspire us in many ways that we don't realize. So I encourage you to think and take a look at these. There's been some wonderful uh, information across Canada and the, one of the journalists that I really respect was able to put forward a, an article around why pajamas can impede in hospital and that's Andre Picard. So, so some really unique ways to describe and understand how PGA paralysis can benefit our patients. Uh, national press as well, a, a, about a year and a half ago, a little bit longer. Uh, Brian Dolan and I were on with uh, The Current on CBC with Anna Maria Tremonti before she retired. It was a huge highlight to be able to share nationally this initiative, the importance of deconditioning, the importance of getting our patients up dressed and moving. So there are some uh, two, three key interviews there that you can take a look at if you're interested in. And within our own health authority and Alberta Health Services, we talked a lot about uh, Walkers Gone Wild and we put together a promotional video. And just on the right hand side there in the blue shirt uh, is my friend and colleague Emily Post who put this practice into place for us. So grateful. And again, if you're curious and want to know more about that, that little uh, initiative about Walkers Gone Wild, take a look at that video or follow up with me offline. There are so many people I wanted to thank. Uh, first, I want to thank Loop. It's been years in the making. Unfortunately, with uh, with COVID, we had to pause this presentation about it, uh, from a year ago. And I wanted to thank you and all your members for having me come today and share some of my messages. Uh, I was able to share a little bit about the PGA paralysis and the ties to falls. There's a lot more that we could unpack and uncover. But I wanted to thank you for the time and commitment to your group for preventing falls. As well, one of my colleagues who is actively involved in, in the loop work in Alberta and across Canada that's supporting me in putting this webinar together is Jody Bradner. Jody is a physical therapist that is leads the charge uh, with falls uh, awareness and prevention in our health authority. And I just wanted to thank her for her collegiality and friendship and the time of, of putting this together. At this time, I'll, I'll put it out there. If you ever need to reach me, feel free to. My email is there. My Twitter handle is there. I would actively encourage you if you had questions, uh, maybe you saw something, you're like, oh, I'm not sure what that means, Paul. You want to kind of learn a little bit more about it. And if I can't get to your questions today, please reach out offline. I'm happy to support health authorities with ideas and getting it up, uh, and supporting you and, and your teams as well. So reach out if I can ever be a help. And uh, I'll pause there for any questions that this group might have. And uh, I'll push it back to our facilitators. And, and again, thank you so much for the time today to share my messages, to hopefully inspire people to know how to, to do things a little bit differently and in a way do a small act, but can have a big outcome. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, that was that was wonderful. And, and really, thank you for sharing your extensive knowledge of NPJ paralysis in the, in the program and all your applicable takeaways. Um, it was an energizing conversation. I see lots of positive feedback in the chat box um, of, of just well wishes and, and thank yous. Um, so, so thank you everyone for all of that participation. We do have uh, a couple of questions that are in the, in the Q and A box. If uh, you have any outstanding questions, anyone feel free to add them into the, um, the Q and A box now, and we can go through a, a couple of, of these if, if that works for you, Paul. Um, but when the webinar has ended, just want everyone um, to, before people start signing off after our uh, Q&A session. When the webinar is ended, you're gonna be redirected to Zoom and invited to participate in a short evaluation survey. Um, if you click the blue continue button on your browser, you'll be redirected to the survey. Um, and we'd really appreciate if you could provide some feedback so we can continue to offer these high quality webinars, just like the one we just experienced. Um, so, so thank you everyone. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's go over a couple of, of questions. Um, I think the first one was a, 
a great one. Just wondering if in the study by Sweeney et al, uh, were patients uh, with cognitive impairment included? Do we know this? You know, I don't know that specifically, and I don't recall if that was outlined in the patient population. Um, I could follow up with specifically that article and, and share a little bit about that around the cognition piece. I apologize. I don't have that um, information at the tip of my fingers right now. I just looked at it from a broad perspective of did the initiative uh, increase falls, uh, but not specifically around the patient population or the demographics of some of that patient. So I can look back and, and maybe um, I know there's an opportunity maybe on the Loop website to post further information and I'd be happy to share more depth and breadth to those articles as well. So apologies, I don't know that information up front, but I'll, I'll do my best to get that information to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, perfect. So the next one, oh, we had one, uh, one um, person just in the Q&A uh, sharing their support of Walkers Gone Wild. Um, love that. Love that tagline. It's great. Um, no, it's cool. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, we actually had to tone the name down. In England, it's called <gasps> Pimp My Zimmer. And a Zimmer is a walking frame in England. Um, so yeah, we thought the pimp word was a little bit too radical. Um, so we came with Walkers Gone Wild. But yeah, if you were looking for a secondary reference or a lit search, look up pimp, P-I-M-P. -P. Yes, that is right. My Zimmer. So um, try that as well. But we had to tone the name down and got creative as well. But I really like it a lot. It's fun. Awesome. Um, and then we've got another question. Um, do you think PJ Paralysis... Uh, NPJ paralysis rather can be considered for a specific group of patients based on their assessment of cognition, time of hospital stay, and status of ambulation and comorbidities. That is a deep question. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think what I shared. I want this to be for all patient populations. And we absolutely know that certain population groups might have a a greater response or do a little bit better. Um, because of this initiative. So those that maybe um, were in a care home that had no activation before and they start something like this, we see positives. Uh, medical surgical units are actually medical units that didn't have a focus on surgical pathways of walking, saw massive amounts of, of reduction in length of stay, uh, saw huge indicators from patients around quality of life indicators that went up as well. Uh, our surgical areas that did see, that did have walking protocols and patients saw the benefits uh, in a smaller way, but they did see a huge benefit in the patient experience and the patient uh, reported outcomes as well. So those are some of the benefits that maybe areas that had walking and mobilization programs, uh, but the importance of that clothing piece, I think amplified some of that. So I don't know if I touched on all your questions, but uh, for us, we did not have an inclusion exclusion criteria. As I mentioned, if someone was fully, um, you know, let's say had a, a significant brain injury and weren't able to communicate, we still tried our best to get them into the wheelchair uh, for meals. We got them dressed as much as we could. And if they weren't able to ambulate, then we really focused on what we could manage in that time. It also helped for those that um, maybe weren't aware that they could get out and ambulate too. So that's also busted a lot of myths of how we provided care in the hospital. And one of the, the patient populations I will talk a lot about is our spinal cord injury patients. And early on, um, people pushed me to think, Paul, this is not appropriate to start in a spinal cord injury unit. And I pushed back a bit. I went right to our patients and said, what do you think about this? And they said, I love this. Just because I'm paralyzed from legs down or have a paralyzed um, you know, part of my body, it doesn't mean I don't want to get up and dressed and moving too. Um, so these have benefits on me as well. I want to look at my normal routine. So no, I'm not upset about this. Um, so we did look at it across a lot of patient areas, across different populations. And in the end, we decided, you know, this is something all patients at some point um, whether it's fully ambulating or just getting dressed or putting on a, a hat and talking about that, there's benefits for all patients, all populations, all stages of cognition and age groups as well. So uh, that was a huge push for us is to make sure this fit for every, every patient. Awesome. All right. Uh, another question is um, just wondering if there's been any kind of pushback um, that you've encountered regarding extra time involved from RNs and therapists. And do you have any advice in that regard? Absolutely. And that is uh, part of the slide deck I didn't talk about today was some of the myths that come up or some of the the things we need to bust, the questions, as I meant to, as I, uh, I'm sorry, alluded to earlier, is when you implement a practice, talk to our staff. And we did. We went and talked to our staff early on about this is what we're thinking, what do you bring forward? And the workload is always, always at top of mind. So 
staff thought, there's no way, Paul, am I doing patient laundry? So I busted that myth instantly. No, you know, care providers are not expected to do patients laundry. If we have the barrier of clothing, then that's fine, but we'll get them up and moving. We'll encourage our patients' families to bring in clothing. We'll encourage units like our mental health, our rehab units, well, they have washers and dryers to use that, but do not wash patients' clothing. That is not an expectation. So busted that myth right out of the gate. Um, we talked about how we could look at co-treatments. So when we have a therapist and a nurse working together, what can we do to support you know, that ambulation, that dressing, that ADLs? How can an occupational therapist or a therapy assistant support in some of the nursing care as well around that? You know, when our therapies or our teams are walking or ambulating our patients, how can they kind of encourage again to say, this is your goal for the day? Um, how can they help support some of those? So we try to look at co-treatments. We try to look at things like uh, urinal paralysis, where we could have tips and tricks that weren't going to impact the nursing staff significantly. Uh, we also had a lot of thoughts on, and you can see in this picture, this cartoon, this gentleman has an IV. What about IVs and central lines? If you're changing a gown, for the most part, you have to put the IV through the sleeve. So it can take a little bit of extra time, but at the same time, think about the positive benefits that our patients can see. And again, if we can encourage our patients to do as much for themselves, and again, I think that is a big part of, of care, and I know that's, that's switching, but our patients need to have that permission and uh, the focus that they can help in certain ways as well. And I think ADLs is a huge piece. So absolutely concerns were brought forward about time commitments, clothing, um, you know, co-treatments and, and washing and laundering. And those are the things we tried to bust early on. Another myth of our staff and in, in being so supportive of their patients, they thought, well, some people can't be included because they don't have clothing. They're, you know, maybe, you know, not well off or they're from a homeless population. What we did is we partnered with our volunteer resources team, again, being very fortunate to work in a large health authority. Um, and they were able to provide the patients that didn't have clothing, clothing as well. So there's, and some other niceties such as toiletries and, and shampoos and toilet or um, a toothbrush and things like that. So there, there was lots of things we could do with partnerships, but um, concerns of, of treatments were, were a challenge. And where I think, where I will comment, and I didn't throughout the presentation is, our healthcare aides owned this practice with patients and took it and ran with it. So whether that's how you describe them as PSWs, PCAs, healthcare aides, HCAs, they're all um, have a real role to play because they typically do a lot of the changing bathing and ADLs with patients. So a lot of our units that had success, it was not the RN, it was not the LPN or the health or uh, the allied health team, but it was really the healthcare aide that took it, ran with it and supported the patients uh, with the help from our other health professionals. So hopefully that helped answer your question is it was a real team effort and got creative and how we gave permissions to our healthcare aides to support uh, and really drive this practice as well. One other piece, and I am very long-winded, I apologize for this, but we also got creative and included our volunteers in this work. So on, I think, two to three days a week, we have friendly volunteers that come up in the evenings to just to visit with patients. And we armed them with PGA paralysis buttons, shirts, uh, pamphlets, and educational materials. So when they went and talked to the patients, they would comment positively that they're wearing the clothes and share with them some of the information and, and talk to them a little bit about it, inspire them to say, hey, you know, there's a where were you aware that there's a map of where you could walk our unit or there's a map of this institution where you can actually go and listen to music or hear the piano play so again thinking of non-traditional ways such as our volunteer services to support initiatives awareness um, and to try to decrease any time that our staff might need in care planning awesome thank you paul that's that's a that's a great answer um and I've got another question here. Um, and this may be something that we follow up uh, with the participant um, to give you some time to maybe look into some literature evidence because the question is, um, patients with cognitive impairments often have improved behaviors as a result of increased mobility and getting dressed with less need for chemical and physical restraints. Um, and they're just asking if, uh, if you might have any literature or evidence um, that you know offhand. But if you don't have anything offhand, obviously we can, we can follow up with this participant. Yeah, nothing from my, uh, my work. We, we have not published any of our findings. It's mostly been quality improvement. Uh, we, you know, that's really interesting. Have, have ambulation decreased the use of chemical or physical restraints? 
I should go back and yeah, I'd love to whoever had that question to follow up. I can look back into our, our neural rehab unit specifically who is actively involved in this work, who supports a lot of uh, brain injured patients um, within our, our area might have a really good understanding. So I don't have that answer at my fingertips. Um, and I don't know of any current literature that's out there that talks specifically about, about that piece. But I, I love that idea and that thought that, that um, this initiative could also help with with cognition and, and uh, mental function as well. So kudos to whoever brought that forward. Thank you for sharing. And I'd have to dig in a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, we've got another question. Uh, if you're aware of the initiative of this initiative occurring uh, in other regional health authorities and, and re, uh, health regions in Canada. Absolutely. And that's I think it's something so cool that that a, an avenue like Loop can bring. So we, I have um, had calls and I know um, the four districts in Newfoundland Health Authority have and are actively engaged in MPJ paralysis with myself and Brian Dolan. I've had conversations with Nova Scotia, with Halifax, uh, their hospitals there, some physicians. Uh, we've had some webinars across there as well. Um, many sites in Ontario have started to think and look at this. Uh, we've partnered and done a few webinars in, uh, in the Toronto hospitals and the GTA as well. Uh, I know that Thunder Bay Regional Health Authority has contacted me pre-COVID to do some work with them. Uh, we have Saskatchewan Health Authority that rolled out months after we did in Alberta, and we did that together and tried to have the same outcomes. I know Interior, BC, and Island Health have also reached out uh, and are actively engaged. So there are many health authorities in Canada uh, and internationally that are working on NPJ or something very similar um, that is complementary to the work we're doing. So this has spread and scaled um, pretty large in 2018-19 and, and hopefully with the pandemic, you know, nearing they're coming down off this fourth wave or, or just hitting this fourth wave, we'll see a need to look at how we support long COVID. And I think the message of getting up dressed and moving, um, although simple, can be very strong and, and supportive in our care environments as well. So, yeah. Um, and with our, our last uh, couple of minutes, I thought I'd share um, some, some positive feedback that uh, found its way into the Q&A um, and some fun ideas that uh, some of the participants had. Um, this one's from uh, Kathy. Kathy, I, apologies if I've gotten your name, uh, pronunciation of your last name wrong, but Blomquist. Uh, she says, we like being cheeky too, and so does our clients in assisted living. We are now calling our falls prevention approach let's get physical playing off the song uh sorry let's get functional playing off the song let's get physical i kind of ruined the punchline there um <laughs> it needs a reboot which is my task over the next few months thanks for your inspiring session today paul awesome yeah i love the play on words you know it's great let's get functional and yeah i can just see you know doing the the jazzercise let's get physical that's really cool and uh, yeah, use music. It's socially acceptable. And I love, you know, the way that music can can bring forward uh, emotion and, and thought and intent. So kudos to you. Awesome. Um, I've got another comment uh, and um, some positive feedback um, from Vicki Scott. Um, she says, great presentation on an important issue. Um, from my experience of introducing new policies in institutional settings, it is helpful to lean on the findings from impl implementation science research. Um, the application of this knowledge is featured in the Canadian Fall Prevention Curriculum at the University of Victoria. So um, just uh, highlighting that curriculum there. And she says it has a strong focus on implementation science to train healthcare providers on how to bring about change in practice. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Vicki. Um, and then there, with our last couple of minutes, there was one other outstanding question, but I think it was really covered by um, the um, time requirement question earlier of RNs and, and staff, but it says, do you have any recommendations for how this work, uh, how this would work well in acute care settings for a large hospital um, and making sure um, patient's personal laundry comes back and does not get lost? But I think that kind of answer is there is that um, uh, clinical staff, you're not asking clinical staff to be doing the laundry. That's correct. Yeah. And I think that's the piece where we need that partnership from the families as much as possible. And we see that clothing isn't always available. And I think it's about 70% of the time patients are able to get the clothing. in. when I look at the data, 
Um, but we didn't want that to be a barrier, as I mentioned. So if if there was no clothing, we still promoted the, the deconditioning, the mobilization of our patients in an acute care center. And my first probably six pilot sites were large hospital units, you know, 50 patients plus. Uh, and I think the important piece was understanding role clarity with all our providers. So we put out swim lanes or swim maps, and I love looking at lean and Six Sigma practices. So we, we copied and looked at those. So everyone had an understanding of what their role was. And that's where I, I think those units that honored and empowered their healthcare aides to go out and, and uh, the permission to, to share and educate and talk to the patients about the work, they had a real strength um, because they had a, a real role delineation between what the RN, the LPN or RPN did, the healthcare aide, the unit clerk, the physician, uh, the dietitian, our allied health. So thinking about role clarity in a large unit or a large setting where there are multiple people changing all the time, I think that's important to do. The other thing is having small huddles within maybe 30 seconds seconds or a minute to say, okay, don't forget, you know, John hasn't worn any clothes this week. It's our goal to get him up and moving. I asked him yesterday what he likes. He likes, um, he loves the Blue Jays. So, hey, I got an old Blue Jay shirt I brought in. I'm going to give it to him and hopefully we can get him up today. So again, just those small huddles, the touch points uh, and role clarity of your team, I think go a long way too, especially in a big center. Yeah, no, for sure. All righty, Will, we have got less than a minute to go. So I want to say thank you again, Paul. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, we're so grateful to, to have you today. Um, and there's tons of positive feedback in the chat. So we'll make sure that you get to see a copy of that and all the all the, the well wishes and the, and the great jobs from everyone. So thank you again. Um, and I, th thus concludes uh, today's webinar. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Be safe out there.